The Despair Code, and is Lord of the Rings based on true world history? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, this is Jason Carpenter back for another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm currently being held hostage by a cover band playing about a half a block away. So my window is shut and I'm getting no fresh air and I can still hear a a, a bit of a cover of, uh, what are they playing now? Uh, they were originally playing Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana. It's quite odd to have a song that was kind of the rebellious song, one of the big rebellious songs of my youth being played in front of Mike's Ice Cream as a bunch of toddlers and dirty diapers are dancing to it. It's cool, I get it, that the songs live this long, but I just remember watching that video and, you know, parents are like, oh, why are they wearing that flannel? Why do they dress like that? And now it's totally mainstream. You know one thing I've always wanted to see come back? Cross colors. I, I would I would wear cross colors now. I always like cross colors. I didn't have enough money back then because I was only a fifteen year old kid. But you know, like the red, they kind of had like the African colors vibe. It, that was always good. And then what were those shirts that were like heat sensitive, that you'd like touch it and you could leave your handprint? Those are pretty dope. They should bring those back too. They should bring back. Yeah, how come that's not coming back? How come they're doing all this '80s stuff still? When do I get my '90s? My 90s retro. I guess they're doing a Are You Afraid of the Dark movie. It's kind of kind of 90s. So, today we're going to talk about The Despair Code and Is Lord of the Rings Based on Real Life? And I'm kind of iffy about which one we're going to talk about first. I'm going to go ahead and flip this coin. We're going to go completely random. So, I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with The Hobbit. I, well, everyone has a love-hate relationship with The Hobbit. I have a love-hate relationship with Lord of the Rings. I'm I, I'm not a big fantasy fan, but I was a big Peter Jackson fan, and I was really looking forward to seeing his take on this property. I'd seen Dead Alive and all that stuff, and Heavenly Creatures, and The Frighteners. But anyways, anyways, the so um, I go to see Lord of the Rings, the, I'm sorry, the Fellowship of the Ring, Opening day, first showing. I was super excited to be supporting one of my favorite directors. I was very curious to see if this would go. I walk in to, to watch The Fellowship of the Ring. And something seems really off. Because they showed a scene where like the ring gets lost in the beginning. They show the opening prologue, which was amazing, with Sauron like, destroying all the th- troops and his hand getting cut off. The ring falling in the water. And then I think they showed... Um, Something, and then it was just, then they're in Bilbo's village, and they're doing all this stuff, and I was like, wait, did all that stuff happen yesterday? Like, I don't get what's going on. I knew the Sauron got killed, but how the ring was just in the lake. It's like, I thought Gollum had it for a while, or something like that. For, like, quite a period of time. So I'm watching the movie, and I don't really think anything of it, and then I realize, I'm like, dude, this, the cinematography, I mean, the, the, the movie just doesn't look right. It, it looked really, really, really cheap. And so... We get to the scene where they go to where all the elves hang out, um, Rivendell, River, River, Rivendell. And he's talking to that uh, chick, the elf chick, and they're talking in Elvish, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, what what, what are they saying? And it's like a five-minute long scene, and he's like, the sword's all broken. I'm like, what the hell? Am I supposed to know Elvish and... I'm like, I get it, I've seen Star Trek, and sometimes they don't always translate Klingons, but come on, this thing's going on a little too long, what the hell are these people saying? Well, I remember walking out, and I was just not very impressed by that movie, I always said it looked like it was filmed by a bunch of kids in their backyard, like, you know, that woods behind their house, it was just nothing was super cinematic about it. I found out, a couple weeks later, I was talking to someone about it, I was like, dude, what was up with that scene where they're just talking in Elvish? They're like, oh, they were talking about the sword, and getting it repaired, and... It's like, how do you know that? And they're like, because well, there were subtitles, dude. The movie was cropped off a good, like, foot at the bottom of the screen. So I missed it at the beginning when it said, like, 60 years later. So, because it just looked like it was the next day. Someone's like, oh, look at now we're having this big party. All of the subtitles for the movie were gone. And you'd be surprised if you cut off a foot of a screen, how big badly framed every shot was everyone was like below the uh, like everyone was cut off below the knee it looked super super cheap 
It was so funny. Then I went and saw The Two Towers, and I saw that multiple times in the theater. It's one of my favorite films for quite a while. It still holds up. It's super well. I've never seen a siege done in a movie like that before. And then I was super stoked for Return of the King. And it, to me, it wasn't as good as Two Towers, but it was really good. And I will say this. If any soundtrack is better, if any like orchestral soundtrack is better than Star Wars, the original trilogy soundtrack, it's Lord of the Rings. I mean, that is an amazingly epic soundtrack. All of that being said, imagine living in a world where you believed those events were real. The Battle of Helm's Deep. The destruction of the ring. The great enemy living in the volcano, which I've touched on before. I like that imagery of the people who think that the bad guys live in the black smoking wasteland. It's very easy to fight that enemy. It's a lot harder to fight the enemy when it's a normal person with their own hopes and dreams and stuff like that. But anyways, so this is based on real events. What if I told you that J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of those books and many more, was in the basement of the Oxford Library, found the ancient history of the world, and wrote Lord of the Rings. Well, that's what Jay Widener believes. He is a researcher when it comes to this, like, Hollywood and pop culture and Hollywood and conspiracy. He, he has a YouTube show, or he has, like, a radio show on it. He does a lot of videos and things like that about this subject. So he, he is the one who has the belief that J.R. Tolkien found the history the secret history of the world back from about 6,500 years ago, which would kind of predate the Bible, easily predate the Bible, pushing it towards, if you're looking at the biblical calendar around the time of the floods, he believes this, that Sauron is from Saturn. It's an alien being with an, with an alien army. We'll more on that later. The rings are in reference to the rings of Saturn. So the ring of power is not an actual literal ring, but it's a reference to where he came from. That he also represents, he's he's based, and I know this is going to get a little weird, but he's based on a, Macedon, what was it, Macedonian? Because you don't want to get these facts wrong because they're super important. Let's see, where'd you go? Okay, and so... Um, the enemy's name is Sauron, and quoting him, Sauron is obviously so close to the Mesopotamian dictator Sargon, who invented time. He literally invented clocks, calendar schedules, and really delivered the world into the linear, monochromatic world that we live in now. Now, okay, I'm going to break character as a conspiracy believer right now. Just take a moment out. Nobody invents time. You can invent the measurement of time. But time exists. Plants grow, plants die, they become fertilizer, new plants grow. If I don't have a ruler, there's still distance involved from the, how I walk. But anyways, so this guy believes that Sauron is based on this, and it's all about the uh, manipulate, the bringing Earth into the slavery, and the orcs are like the orcs are like alien clones. And I, I keep saying the hobbits are from Ireland because I think for some reason that's the funniest visual. Like, the Irish people already have bad enough reputations as is. But now you want them to be, like, the wimpiest of all mythological creatures. And the, the, the furriest and the fattest of all of them. What's interesting about this guy is that he... St so he starts off with, with a relatively interesting concept. And then he realizes he doesn't have enough to write a 8,000 word article, which is what this is, roughly. And he's done videos on this. This website is actually citing his work. He, but he's done tons of videos on this and things like that. This is just the easiest way to share via podcast. He realizes there's really not enough information to back this up. So then he goes into this weird thing about giants. How humans are giant. Humans, we have giant. We found giant skeletons. And for proof, he shows some poorly photoshopped pictures and he says look proof then he starts talking about how researchers have been killed and these bones are being hidden by the government totally different conspiracy but whatever then he goes into a third conspiracy saying maybe we're not seeing the good stuff could an uncensored financed detailed investigation reveal bones of Centaurs, Minotaurs, Unicorns, Pegasus, Cerebus, Hydra, Griffins, Dragons, Orcs, Cyclops, Mermaids, Harpies, Pixies, Chimeras, Krakens, and other mythological creatures. What would a pixie skeleton look like? <sighs> hmm. 
But we're not done. Because then he goes from this idea that the government is hiding harpy skeletons from us to the fact that the Great Flood, from biblical times, mind you, was not to wipe away the sinners of the world, but to destroy... You know what? I'm going to let him say it. Quote, I believe the Great Flood also killed animals that were cloned. We have mythological Greek and Roman legends of a half-man, half-horse, three-headed dog, all these mythical animals. They may have been genetic experiments, all that had to be wiped out in a flood to lower radiation levels and to just get rid of the cloned monster madness. And what else would we be left with but the pyramids and fantastic constructions that we can't build today? Unquote. This is like a conspiracy theory convergence. We have ancient aliens. We have hidden history. We have the government covering up uh, the bodies and the bones of the Kraken. How, how you would even know Kraken bones existed, they'd be at the bottom. But anyways, I digress, I digress. This is like conspiracy theory convergence, and he's just kind of reaching and grabbing and throwing all of this stuff in. This guy has a big following, not a huge following, not a huge following, but people listen to this. It reinforces their worldview. Hidden history is one of those things I find it completely fascinating. I don't think we know everything about the world. I think all the, the, his, the historical texts we have are lacking, greatly lacking. But I don't think they were cloning monsters. I don't think that um, a, a guy came down and invented time, and he's like, ha oh, now I will control you if, you know, unless you can destroy the rings, and it was you know, some power ship that he had from Saturn and so on and so forth. But this guy believes it. Now, I think it's pretty obvious. I don't believe a word of this. I don't believe an absolute word of this. But people do, and you can sell anything nowadays. So, of course, Tolkien is dead. He keeps referencing these letters, like, Tolkien would get mad when people said it was just an analogy. And show us the letters. Show, you know, you're you're throwing out there, there's, I get you don't have evidence that, you know, a giant minotaur was beating up an Irishman and, you know, their bones are, you know, they, someone found the minotaur bones and got rid of them. And then the Irish were like, ah, you know, let's just prop the skeleton up, and put a beer in his hand. I get that you don't have those, those photos, but you should have copies of those letters and you don't, but I don't know why I'm never, I don't know why I'm still like a little surprised when people believe stuff that doesn't have a ton of evidence. You, and, and, you know, I want to do an episode on how to create a conspiracy theory, and, and that's part of it. Just create a conspiracy, and the first thing you have to do is to have as little evidence as possible. And I'll actually, you know, I think I might do that for my next episode, because I've been throwing that around a bit. I think that's very interesting. He picked a time period that's so far back, you, you can't find any record for it anyways. But he messed up by saying Tolkien talked about it in letters, but can't. If he could show me letters where Tolkien was like, no, this is based on true events. I've been to the basement in Oxford. Totally different story. Show us the letters. He doesn't have letters. So if he doesn't have those letters, maybe he should despair. Should we go to the despair code now? Now, you know what's funny is the despair code actually plays into this in a way. The despair code can either be seen as a great boon to conspiracy theorists or the reason why you should be completely terrified. So the despair code, once again, is a very, very obscure conspiracy theory. It took me even longer to find information, good information on this than it did for the Lord of the Rings thing. Okay, so let me give you a brief overview. So this is what the despair code is, roughly. The despair code is this. Everyone views reality as they see it. Everyone is basically, we're all gonna, we're, we are all going to experience reality on a different level. So I may experience reality on a level where I'm very happy and I think that the world is going great. And those things will start to be reflected in my life. And you may go oh man, you know, life is crappy and everything sucks and you'll start to see things that reflect back in the world, of your worldview. That's a very basic view of it, but that's that's not the despair code, but that's kind of the basic setup. So how you perceive the world is how you, how the world works with you. People who are happy-go-lucky tend to, even when they stumble, they they find a good way to deal with it, to kind of move on. People who are constantly grumpy and upset 
when they bump into an obstacle, they see it as the world's worst thing because they already have a negative worldview. Now, what the despair code is, is it takes it a step further. So let's say, and this is an example on this post. So let's say you and I are walking through a dark alley. We're walking through separate dark alleys. You know, I, listen, I know that we've spent some time together, but I don't recommend walking through dark alleys with me, just like I don't recommend camping with me or having your car break down on a highway with me. But anyway, so I'm walking through a dark alley and I hear a noise behind me and I don't know what it is and I turn around and I go, that's a cat. It's just, it's just a cat and I keep walking and that's a cat in the alley because I'm my mind is perceiving it to be a cat. And if you're walking down the alley and you hear a noise and you go, oh, it's a monster. It's a monster. Because you're, re- you're basically shifting your reality to how you believe. So it, it goes on to say to someone who has hallucinations, and if they see, if they think it is a eight-armed cat with two heads and they're each like snarling in German... Because the wiring in their brain is messed up anyways, they are actually seeing that. Like, I'll turn around and won't see anything and go, that's a cat. You turn around and don't see anything and you go, that's a monster. Because we don't have enough information, we're creating that. Someone who has an actual hallucination, they're creating it and they can smell it and they can see it and they can hear it. So they've kind of broken through the code, the coding. They actually are getting the stimulus that I don't see the cat, you don't see the monster, but... Anyways, so because we basically make our reality as we think it, it's kind of writing on the fly, we can create problems for ourselves. So you're thinking, okay, well, but that doesn't, why would that cause despair? Why would that cause problems? This is kind of, I think, the meat of the post, and this is what I wanted to really read. We are the universe. Everyone is the universe by himself. By talking and communicating, we exchange data with other universes. So I'm in one universe where it's just a cat. You're in another universe where it was a monster. And when we talk, we're facing each other, but we're actually conversing between realities because we can't really intrude on each other's realities. We're just basically reading each other's energy, and that's what we touch and feel and things like that. We live on the same planet, same place, but are still somehow separated by our body, but still connected through communication. Keeping that in mind, anything you imagine to be real, is real. If you think you are followed, you are. If you believe there is a monster in your closet, there is. There moves something in the corner of your eye? Guess what? It wasn't only an imagination. Following these thoughts all the time will eventually make your mind fragile and paranoid until your mind dissolves into despair of all things that are out there to get you. These line of thoughts, the realization that everything is real, and admitting this, is the despair code. Okay, so that's basically it. The despair code is the idea that every paranoid thought you have, every worry and fear is real. And once you start, you you basically you're regressing to a childlike state. Because when you're a child and you hear something under your bed, it's a monster. And then someone has to explain to you that monsters aren't real. But if you buy into the despair code, you hear that and you think it's a monster. It is a monster. It's an app. It's a monster because your mind is creating that reality. Until you look under that bed to see that it's not a monster, it is a monster. The monster exists because you believe it exists. Because we're all, we can only experience the reality that we perceive, that we're reading. I can't perceive your reality. You can't perceive my reality. We can communicate between dimensions. But in the end, we're in our own reality. Here's the thing. I do think there's some truth to that. But I think they're looking at it from the wrong angle. I think it's basically the secret turned evil. It's the secret from Sauron, is what it is. It's this idea that everything, every... If you think someone's coming up behind you with a knife, guess what? Someone's coming up behind you with a knife. And if you don't turn around and look and prove that he's not there, he's there. And eventually, you're not going to look. You're going to try to convince yourself that he's not there, and you're going to feel the blade go through the back and pop your lung. 
that's the despair code. However, I would say I, I sit around. I don't sit around. I work hard. I mean, I know I'm kind of a bumbling fact. I have half the facts. I'm bumbling. I mispronounce a bunch of words. But I really enjoy doing this podcast. I really enjoy the format. I don't spend my free time just, you know, dicking around. I'm looking for ways to market the podcast. I'm constantly talking up my podcast. I'm ta- constantly going places, trying to build up a podcast audience. And while I'm doing that, I'm imagining my podcast audience growing. I'm taking action and I'm visualizing people discovering my podcast. And guess what? Every day people discover my podcast. Coincidence? Yeah, sure, possibly. I'm doing the legwork. But I'm imagining, I'm visualizing people discovering my podcast and enjoying it and being like, oh, that's so funny. Like, it's this weird comedy podcast where he's kind of an idiot, but at the same time, he's really earnest. Ho, ho, ho. So, you know, this is a good podcast. I'm going to wreck it to my friends. I visualize myself. I visualize myself losing weight. I tell myself I'm losing weight. I'm losing weight every day. I visualize these things. So you can hack the system you can't hack your reality i truly believe that i think there's might be some limitations to it but i think you can i think the despair code in a sense is real if you are constantly negative and you're thinking there's a monster in the bushes there's a monster in the bushes maybe there is a monster in the bushes maybe it's not maybe it's not a you know google ox Maybe it's not like this giant furry beast, but there's something there that's drawing negative energy, you know, putting negative energy on you, pulling good energy away. Maybe it is an actual monster. I don't know. But if you go through life and you're not imagining the monster, or you hear that noise and you go, ah, it's just a cat. Now, don't get me wrong. I am a fairly paranoid person. I don't, if I hear something behind me, I don't automatically go, oh, it's just a fluffy cat, just so some guy can, like, take me to his rape dungeon. Like, I am fairly paranoid as far as that goes but i don't let that become the quote-unquote despair code if i'm walking through the dark my guards up if i'm in public my guards up but when i'm sitting at home i'm doing stuff or whatever even if i start to get a negative thought i try to break that negative cycle and put in positive thoughts that's been a big part about this podcast. So so let me just say, I know a lot of people tune in to kind of hear these weirder conspiracy theories. And I know I have a contingent of listeners who like this stuff and I don't want them to be like, oh man, I now I know about the despair code and I'm thinking there's a monster under my bed. It is what you make of it. The code, I think, does have a seed of truth to it. Unlike that stupid Lord of the Rings thing. And I guess if you believe that Lord of the Rings and your despair code and blah, 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 then maybe in your reality, the Lord of the Rings... Lord of the Rings is a true story, but we're in my reality right now, and that's dumb. That's so stupid. But anyways, take those take those negative thoughts, turn them into positive thoughts. Be a positive thinker. You Trust me. Trust me. It, it will treat you well. I think that's going to be it for tonight. I've done so many variations and so many edits of this episode. I talked about Lord of the Rings for probably a half hour straight. I had to go in and, and completely chop stuff up and re-record that. It was dry. That was my despair code. Was that stupid Lord of the Rings story? Because sometimes stuff is too dumb to even comment on. So funny. I talk about positive thoughts and then I just talk trash about this guy forever. But I think you know what I mean. The despair code, yes, is real. But turn it into the pair code. Is pair the opposite of despair? despair pair whatever anyways have happy thoughts there is no monster under your bed regardless of what reality you're in just remember that but that doesn't mean you shouldn't lock your door at night this is the part of the podcast where i just kind of start talking in circles and i hope that the exit music is is starting is it is it going right there i don't know i'm the one in charge of putting the exit music in but you know we'll see uh, deadrabbit.com is where you can find all of our podcast episodes. We have the YouTube channel at Dead Rabbit Radio. Uh, Dead Rabbit Radio at gmail.com if you want to drop me a line, or you can hit me up on Twitter at Jason O. Carpenter. And that will be it for today. Uh, my voice is actually going hoarse. You have no idea how long I've been recording this episode, but trust me, it was totally worth it. I'm having a great time. I'm hoping you're enjoying the show, and we will see you tomorrow. That was kind of like an outro. I might keep that.